Um, I want to talk today about um, uh, a conversation, an argument that's going on, which is um, uh, roughly falls under the uh, uh, banner of um, uh, uh, decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, that means to say uh, there's a conversation taking place in our schools and colleges uh, which is about uh, essentially a reform of the history uh, of uh, the empire and of uh, uh, the colonies and, and Britain's uh, role in that. Uh, I think it's an important discussion. It tells us a lot. Uh, I have to say, if the people that I'm talking about are right, um, all the conversation that we've had up till now is redundant uh, because part of the, uh, the argument of decolonizing the curriculum is that the curriculum is Euro uh, centric and uh, um, uh, uh, I, I noticed this. Uh, um, you know, uh, I was talking to somebody about uh, who's keen on this kind of uh, um, uh, argument uh, about uh, this conference, and they said, "Oh, well, that's rubbish! Look at that! It's all about Europe." Uh, and, um, and I said, "Well, yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> there's a lot about Europe." He said, "Well, you're never going to find anything about." Uh, uh, looking at Europe because Europe's not where it's at and uh, that's kind of a lot of the sentiment of uh, decolonizing uh, the curriculum uh, and uh, uh, to give some uh, meat to it I want to talk about some people that are writing today and I'm going to start with um, uh, 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 there are a number of people I want to look at. Uh, 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 the, it, it, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's a great time for reading about the history of empire. There's um, exponential growth uh, in books about the history of the empire. Uh, I've added some uh, turgid monographs uh, of, uh, uh, to that um, uh, uh, study. Uh, and you can read about everything. You can read about um, uh, 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 the uh, palm olive uh, in the Congo. Uh, you can read about uh, uh, Luca Janji's struggle against South African imperialism. And there's, uh, every year, it seems, more and more published. There's a great amount of interest uh, in the whole empire question, which I think is kind of spurred by the kind of conversation that I'm going to talk about. I want to, there are a number of authors I want to talk about. Um, uh, uh, the, the important ones, the ones that are active uh, in the intellectual program of decolonizing the empire aren't by and large empirical historians, but uh, theorists, political theorists, sociologists, uh, and I'll talk about them in a bit. But I also think that we should start really with um, what's most popular, and there's a, a, a really interesting kind of genre developed of um, uh, um, uh, autobiographical uh, accounts of racism uh, in Britain, which I'm sure some of you have read, like uh, René Addo Lodge's uh, a very interesting book, um, uh, Why I Won't uh, Talk to, Why I'm Not Talking to White People About Race. Uh, all the white people bought it. Um, uh, the um, uh, um, Afua Hirsch's book, um, uh, uh, Brit-ish, uh, uh, and also uh, recently uh, uh, Carla's book, which is called Natives, uh, and uh, uh, Kehendi Andrews, all people talking, and they're, they're really good books, you know, really compelling kind of narrative stories, uh, which are kind of moving, because they're uh, really autobiographical accounts of what it's like growing up black in Britain, uh, and um, they all cope with this kind of uh, existential crisis that they describe, uh, each of them severally, about uh, not feeling represented, uh, not feeling that they are um, represented in the history and in the schools and by their teachers and, and, and their sense of personal alienation being uh, peculiarly aggravated by uh, by that whole thing and really trying to make the case, therefore, that, uh, you know, we should have a lot more uh, history of uh, the British Empire and the colonies uh, and the, of slavery and of the, of the uh, uh, terrible uh, uh, sins that were committed uh, in the empire. Otherwise, it's not true. And uh, I, I, it's a compelling point that all, all three of the books I've talked about, they all start kind of with this hook, you know, the, the hidden... Uh, history of the empire, the, the history that's disguised. And uh, uh, just to be argumentative, that's quite strange because uh, all three of the authors I'm talking about were born uh, in the 1980s, which means to say they were all at school after the introduction of Black History Month uh, and uh, after what has actually been a huge revolution uh, in the teaching of empire and colonialism 
and slavery in British schools. 1987, the Black History Month was started by the uh, London Residuary Body, the uh, old GLC, adopted by the Association of Local Authorities. Uh, and uh, there were a great many uh, little uh, uh, innovations in teaching. Uh, uh, she died last year, but um, uh, Dawn Gill uh, uh, wrote a very important paper about teaching geography and why it was imperialistic to look at the rest of the world as what they can do for us. Uh, and that paper was uh, published by the Institute of Education. They had a, a conference later. She wrote a book, uh, edited a book later on, uh, on uh, uh, teaching colonial history. That was about 1991. So uh, not wishing to be, you know, I've been a bit argumentative. So it really isn't true uh, what any of these authors are saying, that uh, there is a hidden history of British colonialism. On the contrary, I would say there's a great interest in British colonialism in our schools and teaching the history of British colonialism and in particular of slavery. And this is really kind of burgeoned up and you kind of wonder, you know, Akala went to um, uh, um, uh, 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 Ackland Burley School where my uh, daughter went and I've seen their library and uh, I can tell you it's very full of books about slavery. Uh, and actually when you read the, the different accounts, um, the, uh, they all actually describe the same thing, which is that um, uh, the revelations come not when they're not taught about um, uh, um, the history of empire, but when it comes up in the class. So Akala has this massive fight with his history teacher uh, because the history teacher the year previous has insisted that they put in a, a module on uh, slavery and colonialism and, and this causes a big fight. Uh, he gets excluded from the class. It all ends rather badly, rather tragically, but uh, it's given him some good grist uh, for his book. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that, uh, and uh, 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 Rennie Edo Lodge describes this uh, kind of Damascene moment when she's kind of suddenly attentive to uh, her difference, you know, a sense of racial difference. And it doesn't happen, you know, when she's been bullied by the police in Bristol or, or you know, anything like that. It's in a, a history seminar, uh, which is they're doing a module on slavery. And she's a bit upset that a friend it doesn't want to carry on with the module and isn't as interested as her. And then she says, that's when I begin to understand that um, uh, British people are very upset about their history. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, OK, but um, uh, you're all actually responding to the fact that we're teaching the history of uh, colonialism and slavery a great deal more. And that's because of uh, actually uh, we're kind of 40 years in. Uh, to the reconsideration. You know, the, um, uh, uh, the book, uh, you know, many of you will have um, looked at maybe quotes from uh, when you were at college. Um, Edward Said's book on Orientalism was published in 1978. That's, you know, before uh, uh, René Edo Lodge or Afro Hirsch or Akala were even born. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, you know, so there is actually a great amount of interest in the history of colonialism uh, and, and, and in the history of slavery. And I don't really believe either that uh, the way those things are taught in British schools uh, is, uh, you know, slavery was okay, you know. Or uh, I don't think people are, uh, you know, is it not even the case either that uh, so often in English schools people are taught, well, you know, Wilberforce freed the slaves and, you know, we're liberal and good ever since because actually most educators in our schools seem to be very interested in this whole critical uh, uh, dimension uh, uh, to the thing. I would go a bit further. I did this test on my daughter and if you were asking somebody uh, growing up or going to school in Britain today and you would, you would say, uh, I don't know, um, so I said, uh, 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 who's Nelson Mandela, she told me. I said, who's Nelson? She had no idea. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Um, uh, and I'm, I was thinking about, you know, because I, uh, you know, I went to school too, uh, and, uh, you know, students today are more likely to know uh, the story of uh, Alado Equiano's life uh, than they are to know about Fergus O'Connor, the Chartist. It's not uh, likely to jump out. More likely to know about the Empire Windrush, maybe, than the uh, Tash, Taff Vale decision, um, which I can assure you we did know when I was growing up uh, because it was very important uh, in that small part of uh, 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 the north of England. Um, and, uh, you know, if you ask students, as I often do, I said, well, you know, uh, what do you know about the Brixton riots? They know all about that. I said, what do you know about the uh, steel strike that took place the year before? Crickets, you know, because it's just not important in terms of our contemporary understanding of today. Though actually... Um, 
Labour historians will know, that was a really important moment in the transition of Britain. Uh, are they more likely to know what happened to Stephen Lawrence uh, than they are to know uh, what happened uh, uh, to Arthur Scargill? I think they probably are. And um, that's really is because we're not, uh, uh, it's simply not true that we're in a moment where, uh, 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 you know, it just isn't, it doesn't stand up that uh, 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 British people are not interested in the history of uh, the empire and of colony, nor is it true that they have an apologetic account. I'd say much more likely uh, in most schools, I may be influenced, I am growing up, uh, you know, I'm raising children in uh, the north of uh, uh, Islington, so I appreciate that's not quite the same as the whole country, but I would say on the whole the evidence to me seems to be that uh, 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 the um, academic uh, boards are very interested in those kinds of questions. I also think it's kind of not true either because, um, uh, you know, uh, whilst, you know, history teaching often did have a kind of aggrandizing kind of picture of the empire. It was never true that they uh, left all that other stuff out. You know, it was always a kind of, you know, people knew those things. It's just they kind of emphasized the other bit. You know, people in Britain, it's true that uh, the mainstream of British culture for most of uh, uh, the, uh, the last 200 years been kind of pro-imperial, but there's always been an undercurrent that goes the other way. You know, when uh, King Ketchweo, uh, uh, the Zulu uh, leader, came uh, uh, to London in 1884, there were crowds outside his door. In Birmingham, uh, uh, for 50 years, the Birmingham Ladies Negroes Friends Society met, uh, arguing the case uh, 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 to alleviate the position uh, of the uh, uh, black people in the colonies. So it really isn't really entirely true that um, uh, uh, all of British history has been a kind of gung-ho hymn of praise uh, to empire and colony. I think more importantly, it's definitely not true today. And I'd say it's much more the case that um, uh, at least in, uh, you know, about half the schools, there's a, a much more critical attitude uh, to the whole question. That's uh, to talk a bit about schools. Um, um, you know, the, uh, if you go uh, look, uh, uh, you know, further afield, you know, when you leave school, where do you go? You go to uh, university, maybe. Uh, and um, if you go to university right now, you'll be coming into uh, universities which are discussing a, a proposal, which is to decolonize the curriculum. To decolonize the curriculum. That's uh, a, 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 a developed strategy that's being discussed. You probably noticed it um, uh, when in Oxford, in an echo of something that happened in uh, uh, Cape Town, there was a campaign to remove the statue of Cecil Rhodes, of Cecil Rhodes who'd um, uh, uh, gifted money uh, uh, to Oxford University uh, for the education of uh, students from the colonies. Um, and um, uh, so there's a big campaign, you know, let's bring, get, let's, uh, uh, you know, Rhodes must fall, uh, take him down, uh, which he didn't, by the way. That's interesting in its own right that um, uh, uh, Rhodes didn't fall. Uh, but um, uh, the academics at Oxford have, have undertaken a, 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 a position where they think that we must uh, discuss and debate the uh, problems with uh, Rhodes's uh, colonial empire and use it as a teaching moment. But Rhodes Must Fall was a very successful campaign uh, uh, if it didn't succeed in bringing down the uh, statue, uh, the, the statue in Oxford, um, uh, it was a very successful campaign in highlighting the question of decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, and what we've seen, you know, I was at a conference uh, um, uh, uh, the other day, uh, a geography conference, where uh, decolonizing the curriculum was really at the fore of the whole uh, kind of question. And uh, the people that are uh, uh, arguing this case, I'm going to uh, name a few. Um, uh, they are uh, Gaminda Bam Bambra, who's at uh, uh, Warwick University, uh, Robbie Shilliam, who was at Queen Mary's, uh, and he's uh, just left uh, uh, to teach at uh, John Hopkins uh, in America, uh, and um, uh, 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 a woman who was in the uh, had an unfortunate uh, experience with a uh, a security guard. Cambridge University, it's got, got Priyam Vada uh, uh, Gopal, uh, and um, uh, people made fun of her, but, um, you know, it, it's serious. And uh, Alex Anivas, um, who's the uh, Leverhulme uh, young scholar, Leverhulme, Lord Leverhulme, palm olive soap, uh, 
uh, expropriated from the uh, uh, suffering people of um, uh, the Congo. Um, uh, uh, but Alex Inevis, rather in, in uh, disobedience to his uh, sponsor, is a great champion of decolonizing the curriculum. He wants to take all the colonial assumptions out of the curriculum and um, I want to, uh, I'm going to go through some of the ideas of what decolonizing the curriculum would mean because they're quite extensive in their uh, uh, kind of proposals uh, just in a moment. But those scholars uh, and activists um, and they're backed, you know, they're backed by the National Union of Students in particular the uh, President uh, Malia Bouartia uh, um, who, who gave a big endorsement to this program uh, and uh, uh, activists like the uh, SOAS academic uh, Adam Cooper Elliott, and they're all uh, working around this program, but they will say, um, uh, if they were here, they would say, no, no, you're wrong, James, because actually we're at a, 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 a really important moment of the resurgence of colonial ideas, and they say, um, look, they say, uh, have you noticed that the discussion paper that the Foreign Office drafted uh, 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 for its uh, Brexit program was uh, called Empire 2.0? Um, uh, which it was, you know, but, uh, but it was a disc, and we've seen, you know, the quality of the discussion documents that were uh, floating in the Foreign Office, uh, mostly blank sheets of paper, we have to assume. But anyway, so they see in the, particularly at the moment right now in Brexit, uh, they see a kind of return to a kind of colonial uh, sentiment, and they're particularly aggrieved uh, that um, uh, a theologian uh, 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 at Oxford, um, uh, Nigel Bigger, has organized a, uh, um, a kind of seminar, uh, which is, a, as it were, a kickback. Um, you know, uh, let's try and uh, moderate this point. Let's have a more nuanced uh, moral investigation of the empire. Uh, his work, I mean, I've, I've met him, he's a nice guy. Um, he's a little, you know, conservative, I'd say, would be reasonable. Um, but he's certainly not like a gung-ho, let's recolonize the world, uh, uh, take it over. Uh, 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 but that's pretty much how he's painted. And uh, Nigel Bigger fe features unnaturally large uh, in the discussions of the decolonizer curriculum, and you feel that they kind of need each other. You know, Nigel Bigger, uh, uh, I think, you know, we shouldn't decolonize the curriculum. Imperialist, down with you. Uh, and they also particularly hate uh, that guy, uh, Niall Ferguson, who uh, went off uh, uh, to teach at Yale. Well, and I can see why they hate him, because um, he had the great nerve to write what was actually a rather readable book uh, about the empire, which is, it must be particularly aggrieving, you know, but, um, uh, uh, when you read uh, uh, some of the other stuff. Um, uh, um, he is kind of right-wing, but uh, these characters are made to stand for a, a presumed uh, push to, uh, 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 you know, to recolonize the world, uh, 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 for an intellectual defense of colonialism, uh, for a, a restoration of the colonial idea, which I don't think really stands up. I, you know, I think in a sense that they, they kind of need each other. Nigel Bigger needs um, uh, uh, Priyam Vada Gopal, and Priyam Vada Gopal needs Nigel Bigger to, uh, so that they can both play the part of the aggrieved uh, underground uh, uh, campaign struggling uh, 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 to make their voice heard against the uh, assumed uh, uh, orthodoxy, uh, orthodoxy being the opposite of whatever you think. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, Nigel Biggers. Um, he hasn't published that much for a start. Um, uh, you can, there are very good uh, conservative historians. I uh, particularly recommend uh, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's book on uh, the Ghosts of Empires. Very good. Uh, Ferguson, readable, but uh, pretty uh, ideological. Um, I'm really going to talk about the other side, the, the decolonizers, because actually I think the... Um, uh, intellectual impetus is kind of with them, and that's my argument. I think that they, have, uh, they are actually uh, more likely uh, setting the agenda, uh, and uh, the rather um, uh, faint uh, uh, nostalgia for empire is, uh, uh, generally speaking, a kind of a weak idea. I think um, when I get into it, I'm get, there's a lot of detail in this and, and ideas which what may seem strange, but uh, I think you can see where they come from if you think it through. I think one of the first things that really stands out is that they have a very long-term view of uh, colonialism. Colonialism is, um, which you might have thought was like an event, 
you know, or a thing that happened, you know. But actually, it turns out it's, uh, if you read uh, 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 some of the authors I'm going to talk about, that it's vast, you know. Its span is like 500 years of colonialism, uh, uh, which spreads. It's so huge, the history of colonialism, of, uh, uh, that uh, you feel kind of diminished inside of it. You know, it's very difficult to understand how you could fix anything if colonialism was quite as big as they say. Uh, the best, I think, you can do, really, is to kind of call it out, you know, to uh, uh, distance yourself from it. So I think that periodization, you know, the idea of colonialism is, you know, 1492, even earlier, actually, uh, in this version, uh, right through to the present day, makes it almost like an impossible thing to confront, you know, and um, uh, it doesn't make you think that this is something that you could change. So these, uh, this is Gamenda Bambra. Uh, she's writing, she says, uh, and uh, she's particularly interested in... Uh, you know, what's the relationship of colonialism and capitalism? And she says, you know, colonial expansion preceded uh, uh, capitalist relations. Uh, the latter were created and maintained through colonial violence. So it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. And she takes issue, you know, as is often the case with, um, uh, you know, different schools of thought. Um, uh, she takes issue with the previous generation of um, uh, uh, decolonial thinkers. Uh, uh, she's very angry with um, uh, 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 Emmanuel Wallerstein, um, it, which su surprises you at first, uh, and also Samir Amin. So she says to Emmanuel Wallerstein, who wrote uh, big books about how terrible uh, colonial, colonialism was, but uh, she's uh, dissatisfied with this uh, with his complaints, he says, she says, colonialism in Wallerstein's account is something to be located within the world system. World system was his particular category, not a, a, a historical process that's constitutive of the world system. So it's like everything is colonialism in this particular account. Colonialism is expanded uh, to embrace all connection in the world. Is, it comes under this uh, category of colonialism. It's everywhere. And uh, definitely on no account is it a uh, you know, conjunctural or a temporary thing. It's, it's written into uh, every connection. Uh, Alex Anivas, the uh, uh, Leverhulme scholar, he says... Uh, uh, and he's again, he's talking about uh, uh, the ideas of capitalism and particularly in uh, 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 Samir Amin and Wallerstein's thought. He says, what, what we're after here is not an explanation of how capitalism tends towards colonialism. We argue the reverse, uh, that in part colonialism explains the emergence of capitalism as a mode of production. Now, historically, there's a small tiny point. Uh, in this. You know, it, it's obviously true that, uh, well, it's not obviously true, but uh, historically it's, it's true that lots of people who traded goods uh, before we had big factories and industrialism and capitalism proper uh, did it overseas. You know, uh, there, there are these companies and uh, lots of the early money uh, that came to be invested in cotton mills and uh, 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 industry in, uh, uh, in London and in, in the north of England, uh, uh, you know, got their money from either the East India Company or the, the West India trade. You know, these were important uh, 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 small uh, points. But I don't think any of that justifies the kind of uh, argument that's being made here, whereas they're really saying that uh, colonialism is, as it were, outside of history. It's, uh, it's perennial. Um, uh, and the, the point of, uh, yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it's no longer really, the conversation they're having is not really transformative. It's not about changing or, or, or overcoming colonialism. Uh, it's a kind of a moralistic one about uh, where do you stand uh, in relation uh, uh, to colonialism. I think also I'd like to talk about um, another proposition uh, which is, uh, 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 contains, uh, uh, is in, uh, to do with that, where they talk about the non-Western origins of the world system. And this is a very peculiar argument because it doesn't seem to pull in the direction that you would expect it to pull. Um, uh, perhaps I've misunderstood uh, uh, some particular nuance, but um, uh, uh, all of the authors that I'm talking about are very keen to say that, um, uh, reject the idea that, colonial, that um, uh, 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 modern society began in Europe and expanded outwards, which they think is Eurocentric idea. They don't want to say modern society started in Europe and expanded outwards, uh, because if that was true, then uh, somehow Europeans would have ownership of it, and that would be against them. So Robbie Shilliam, he says, the non-capitalist uh, social forms and political organizations are not simply sublated uh, under the movement of capitalism, but they are co-constitutive 
of the movement itself. And they're saying it's the, in the relationship of the West to the rest of the world uh, that the modern world comes about. And the importance for them is they're saying that um, uh, uh, if you're working with a, an intellectual model which says that uh, um, the Western uh, 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 forms of uh, social organization were uh, uh, exported outwards and reproduced throughout the world, then you are essentially uh, uh, giving uh, kudos and authorship uh, uh, to what, are what we really should understand as restrictedly Western uh, things. Uh, and he says, you cannot, says Sir Shilliam, you cannot adequately explain modern world development through a narrative that starts with the rise of capitalism, nation and class within England uh, and Europe. And you have to go instead and look at all these different relationships, the Arab trade routes, uh, uh, the uh, Silk Road, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Americas and what was happening there, because otherwise you can't really understand it. Um, uh, and they're really um, angry, uh, with, um, particularly with uh, a guy, I mean, it's ironic really, because Samir Amin in 1988 wrote a book called Eurocentrism, you know, so he, he made Eurocentrism into a, an issue, um, you know, uh, what, what's that, 30 years ago. Um, so, uh, he, uh, 40 years ago, isn't it? 30? 30 years ago, sorry. Uh, and he's, uh, this is his idea, he says, you know, historic capitalism, he says, it took the form of the capitalist mode of production, uh, uh, became established on a world scale, uh, took shape in the beginning of the 16th century in London, Amsterdam, Paris, Triangle, and it attained its uh, complete form in the French Revolution and the English Industrial Revolution. Oh, no, it didn't, says uh, Gamenda Bambra. Uh, no, no, that's really wrong, because you've got to understand that um, uh, the modern world was co-created uh, in the relationship between uh, the West uh, and other parts of the world. Uh, and Alex Anivas, he says, he, he actually wrote these words, he said, we must call out these self-aggrandizing narratives of Western exceptionalism. The argument is that if, uh, if you make an argument that uh, 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 democracy or nationalism or uh, modernity or uh, uh, free markets or capitalism uh, developed in Europe and was uh, rolled out across the rest of the world, you're really giving authorship uh, uh, to the West. Like I say, I think this is, I find this a rather eccentric argument because it, I don't think it, it does the work that they hope that it uh, does. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to make fun, but uh, Alex Anivas uh, wrote this book about how the West came to rule. Uh, and in it, he says, you know, we've got to uh, in, in pursuit of this project, we've got to restore the historical agency of the Mongolian Empire uh, in the making of uh, capitalism back in the 13th century. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, come on. Uh, anyway, but, uh, and his evidence isn't that striking. You know, so he, says, um, uh, he says that uh, apparently it was very important, the Pax Mongolica. That's his word, the Pax Mongolica. Uh, the Pax Mongolica, you know... Genghis Khan got a bad deal from history, um, uh, but apparently the Pax, Mo we never thought, you know, there used to be this guy uh, wrote a column uh, in uh, uh, the Daily Telegraph called Peter Simple, and he would always include the Mongolian Liberation Front as a caricature of the left. I didn't think it would be actually adopted as a kind of a, anyway, um, the, uh, his, his, his arguments on that, you know, he said Pax Mongolica, but I forgive me, but he also says, uh, you know, a uh, really important uh, Mongolian uh, um, export was the Black Death. <laughs> says, uh, you know, the, the Black Death, because, it, uh, you know, the people, I know that this is an argument, that um, the Black Death, because it reduced the population, concentrated capital in a number of hands, uh, and, you know, it's, by some accounts, they say that this is very important to the development of modernity. But uh, I think he goes a little bit further. He says, you know, the unintended... Uh, destructive yet regenerative uh, consequences of the Mongol Empire's, quotes, unification of the world by disease is an often overlooked and under-theorized form of inter-societal uh, uh, reaction. Well, I'm thinking, you know, that's not really recovering the uh, agency of the Mongolian Empire, is it? <laughs> to say uh, they gave us the Black Death. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, that might be cheap, but um, the, uh, uh, more importantly, the, uh, in a lot of the uh, scholarship, uh, there's a great emphasis upon um, 
uh, nomads. You know, they, they talk about the role of nomads, uh, and in particular of the international. And they talk about uh, lots of, you know, uh, whether they're like Arab traders is often the case, or troubadours, uh, uh, you know, all the people that kind of floated around uh, in the uh, Middle Ages. And, and, and in this particular account, they're really responsible for uh, modernity, and they kind of open the world up uh, uh, to modernity. Well, you know, some small elements in this. Uh, you know, you, we see this like in, uh, I don't know if you saw David Olasorga's uh, history of um, uh, uh, Black Britain, and he, he, he says, you know, I'm going to find uh, uh, all these black people that we don't talk about in Britain, and he's, he's, he finds uh, there's an African uh, uh, battalion of the Roman, em I'm, I'm not sure they are African, they might just be based in Africa, but in any event, you know, so there's an African battalion uh, and I'm thinking, well, you know, radicals in another time uh, didn't really identify with the Roman uh, uh, occupation, <laughs> did they? they? They kind of thought of, you know, the Celts were more like the heroes, you know, like Howard Brenton. But, uh, you know, if, you, if, it, if it means I can find, you know, a black guy back in whenever it was, you know, I'll, I'll find him there. Um, would be like saying the, you know, the black presence in Japan after the Second World War. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, in any event, so, but the, I think what's important about this idea of the nomad and the people around the edge is that uh, they're particularly attractive to them because it kind of uh, represents what they say is, uh, you know, kind of the importance of the international, uh, the international origins of modernity. And they're really uh, keen to emphasize that it's not the uh, within Europe uh, that the change happens, it's at the edges of Europe. And like I said, there's some small uh, historical uh, uh, antecedents to that, but principally I think it's wrong because in, in, in the strict sense modernity comes at the point of involution. It's about when all that capital comes home uh, that um, uh, the real transformation happens. It is an inward moment, a self-reflective moment, and that's also true in the political sense that democracy is really about a, a, a move towards uh, 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 the uh, 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 European countries looking at their own uh, uh, situation and taking their eye off uh, the international to some extent. I think when you make the international or the nomad uh, into the lead character, what you're really doing is you're diminishing uh, uh, the populace, the people. You're saying that the people are less important, uh, that the international, uh, uh, if the international is the important place, uh, then the national is, is demoted, it becomes less important, and the role of uh, uh, national populaces in making modernity becomes uh, uh, secondary. So I really want to, uh, you know, I'm pushing the point here, but uh, if I was to say, the, uh, to draw it out, what I would say that the decolonizing the curriculum, if you were to uh, take off the um, disguise, as it were, you would say that this is pretty much the same intellectual program that we used to call postmodernism. It's essentially a deconstruction of modernity. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember what that was like at college, you know, when people, modernism, you know, and, you know, everything was being deconstructed. It always had the feel of being slightly hoity-toity, um, uh, looking down your nose, you know, and you had to learn all these weird categories. Uh, and uh, it, it all felt, you know, like a rich man's game, the whole postmodern thing. And I guess that lots of people that were in it, uh, felt that too and, you know, didn't really relate, you know, felt that they're a bit uh, at a disadvantage that they uh, had made this weird language that it was so forbidding. And so they wanted to kind of um, uh, uh, find ways to talk about it that were a bit more um, populist, you know, uh, had a greater sense of uh, social justice within them. And I think the, the contemporary discussion about decolonizing the curriculum, it, it yokes the uh, 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 intellectual movement of postmodernism, of deconstruction, uh, of uh, uh, undoing modernity, uh, with a, uh, by tying it to um, uh, the uh, reputation of those people who challenged the British Empire and the French Empire uh, and other empires uh, back in the 1950s, uh, and, and 1960s. So decolonizing the curriculum. And you have to think, you know, there's something kind of decolonizing the curriculum. It's a little bit, uh, you kind of, it's a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? It's that, you know, what, what are you going to decolonize? The curriculum. Uh, and um, and it's, it's, it seems a bit like after the event relative to the you know, actual decolonization, you know, as a, as a process, as a movement. And you find that lots of the ideas of the uh, uh, 
of the anti-colonial movement, which had this you know, profound democratic um, uh, uh, anti-colonial sentiment, are, are somewhat vulgarized and diminished by their association with what's really a kind of a educational program. You know, um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah wrote this book in 1965. It's called uh, Neo-Colonialism. It's making an intelligent point, which was that having uh, uh, one freedom uh, in Ghana, uh, he discovered to his uh, dismay that actually all the uh, industries in Ghana were still owned by uh, Britons, so that um, uh, colonialism uh, in name had gone. Uh, but neo-colonialism was still there, you know, in the presence of the uh, uh, white owners of uh, 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 Ghana industry. Uh, and I think that was an intelligent point. But neo-colonialism now, you know, he understood, I think, that it was a, a qualification, neo-colonialism. He's saying it's a kind of colonialism by another way. Now neo-colonialism is a, you know, it means... Um, you know, teaching the wrong history in the school. You know, it's about, it's, now it's, it, it's got, you know, uh, appropriating people's culture. Uh, uh, you know, like um, a Graceland LP, which, you know, was bad, but um, uh, it, it's not wicked, is it? So um, uh, decolonization in that way seems a kind of mediocre uh, point. I've, as I've referred to, you know, there was uh, the guy that, uh, who, uh, the scholar who, and later Prime Minister of uh, Trinidad, who... Uh, uh, made all the research about uh, the role of the West India interest and uh, uh, as a, a kind of source of funds for early industrial development, uh, Eric Williams, um, he was making this argument. And um, uh, it was really pointed that uh, all throughout his life, actually, um, his argument was demolished again and again and again. And uh, scholars would come up every year like Roger Anstey and they'd say, no, that's absurd. You know, it's obviously not true. Uh, uh, and uh, Williams, uh, you know, his book, Capitalism and Slavery, was traduced uh, for about 50 years by uh, uh, Cold War historians uh, all attacking him like Seymour Drescher and the like. Nowadays, of course, it's absolutely the norm. You know, if you go to any, um, especially on uh, the West Coast, you go to uh, Liverpool uh, Museum, if you go to uh, Bristol Museum, you'll see that they've foregrounded the, uh, the role of uh, slavery uh, as a source of the investment funds. And uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, academic program that um, uh, um, uh, Catherine Hall uh, introduced, The Legacies of Slavery, which traces all the uh, uh, people that own slaves and puts their names up in you know, a list of shame, uh, David Cameron's family's there, apparently. Uh, you know, and we can, ha ha, you own slaves. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and really kind of emphasizing the point. I've seen Catherine Hall talking. You know, she's very much a defender of Eric Williams. Actually, I think that they go somewhat further because Williams, in his book, he says, at the beginning, you know, he says this was an important source of funds uh, in, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, 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 but by the 19th century, he says, the real foundation of capitalism uh, was to do with the exploitation of the uh, uh, workers in Britain uh, who were working in those factories. Uh, but that's a qualification that would never stand up today because you would never make that point. You would just emphasize again and again the point that uh, it's all owed to the terrible things that, uh, that were done to slaves. And that's really kind of uh, uh, disqualifies any argument that there might be any virtue uh, in uh, the Britain, uh, Britain's Industrial Revolution. So I think really they are vulgarizations. They're really vulgarizations of, of, of colonial, if you wanted to call an anti-colonial theory, of the, the kind of arguments that uh, actual decolonists uh, put up. I'm slightly running out of time, so I'm going to have to run. Um, uh, but if you look at the kind of content of what they're saying, it's very much in the character, not of a, uh, a case against colonialism, but as a case against modernity. So this is Huria uh, uh, Batelgia. Is the, of the, uh, she's uh, in the French group, which is called Indigène de, de la République. This is in her book, a rather creepy book, called um, uh, The Whites, the Jews and Us. Uh, it was kind of woke anti-Semitism. Uh, and in it, um, you know, her real camp, her argument against the colonies is not really an argument against the colonies at all. It's against Western rationality. She says the Cartesian eye, that's individualist after Descartes, he says, it is the eye that will from now on occupy the center. I think, therefore, I am the one who decides. I think, therefore, I am the one who subjugates, pillages, steals, rapes, commits genocide. 
This is her interpretation of um, uh, individualism. She's saying that individualism means rape, steal, genocide. So the very idea of an I uh, is really a, against uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, kind of idea. Um, uh, you know, and uh, I'm slightly racing. The, um, uh, one of the intriguing things about the um, uh, 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 whole school of thought is that they foregrounded the whole idea of Eurocentrism. You know, the whole thing is essentially a critique of Eurocentrism. Uh, and they write an amazing amount on Eurocentrism. Um, just look at it, you know, search Eurocentrism on Google. There's a gazillion uh, responses will come back. Do it on Google Scholar. You'll see uh, uh, thousands and thousands of articles. No, not one of them wrote a book about the European Union. You know, nobody ever thought, you know, critique Europe. Well, what about the institution which is there uh, to elevate the interests of the Europeans over everybody else? Well, no, no, there's no critique of, uh, in fact, you know, as I've been trolling their uh, Twitter fees, they're all very um, um, hostile uh, uh, to Brexit. You know, they, in fact, they, they kind of, they, they love the European Union, Eurocentric as it is, um, but they hate Brexit. They're all really mad on Brexit. Robbie Shilliam's latest book um, uh, uh, is about um, uh, 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 Brexit, and it's about, you know, how could... Uh, 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 people in Britain vote for Brexit. And it's really intriguing because it, it, it completely dismisses any possibility of the idea there might be a, a sovereignty or an idea of sovereignty uh, behind that vote. He says, you know, the preference for sovereignty is in fact just a proxy critique of immigration. Uh, that, uh, you know, the ideal of, um, you know, that you might, uh, popular will, to him is a poisoned word. You know, popular will was driven by an attempt, he says, to preserve a racialized compact between the state uh, business and white labor against dilution by membership uh, of the European Union. Uh, and you see that th uh, throughout the whole thing is they kind of have this thing and a, a friend was saying, well, how do you account for that? Why did they never uh, critique the European Union? Why do they love the European Union if they hate Eurocentrism? I think that because it, it really, uh, they don't like Europe uh, particularly, but they like the European Union because it, as it were, it achieves a similar result uh, that's to say it decenters uh, uh, the popular will. It's about, um, and I, I, you know, uh, uh, I would say in a sense that the uh, uh, colonial masses aren't really uh, an object of sympathy in this uh, because they're just invoked as a kind of way of cancelling out the uh, uh, achievements of the West, of making us feel bad about uh, 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 what uh, the West has achieved, and to say that it's kind of diminished. I think the thing that really stands out above all is that it's weirdly um, arcane. You know, where are the colonies? Which colonies is it they want to overthrow? You know, who are the colonialized uh, masses uh, that uh, would the uh, decolonizers of the curriculum would uh, liberate? Gibraltar, are we talking? Is it the uh, Malvinas, um, the sheep in the Falklands Islands? Is it, uh, you know, the, it, we're not in an age of colonization. The one great, you know, what you might have uh, seen as a real colonizing movement, like uh, uh, the uh, invasion of Iraq, is the literal opposite. At first off, it's a massive failure, uh, which has heaped shame on any kind of prospect of um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, successful Western intervention. But also, it really is not a colonizing uh, movement. It's much more a, a kind of internationalist movement, uh, as was said today. Uh, so I'd say that uh, at the core, really, the, the project is not so much about colonies or, you know, they're colonies of the mind. It's really about uh, uh, decolonize your mind uh, uh, rather than decolonize the world. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the subject of decolonization is only really invoked as a kind of a victim uh, to disqualify uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, sovereignty or, or a movement or um, uh, 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 within Britain or uh, European countries of a, a kind of popular movement. Right.